Thanks, Alicia. So I'm going to introduce Sarjeet Rajendran, who's uh, a wonderful person who's going to give a great talk. I'm sure of that. <laughs> and the title is A Causal Framework for Nonlinear Quantum Mechanics. Uh, Sarjeet and I have collaborated uh, for the last several years. He's a high energy theorist, but he deigns to descend down to low energy and interact with low energy people, both uh, theorists and experimentalists. I'm being I'm being, I'm joking. Sergei got his PhD at Stanford working with Salvas Demopoulos in around 2009, right? Then he was a postdoc at Johns Hopkins. Then he was on the faculty for a number of years in the physics department at Berkeley, which is where I got to know him and where we started thinking about all sorts of crazy ideas. He works closely with people thinking about dark matter detection schemes, ways to use uh, things related to gravitational waves, all sorts of interesting ideas, novel physics ideas beyond the standard model. Uh, and then two or three years ago, was recruited back to Johns Hopkins, where he's now a pre professor in the physics department there. And I think we're going to enjoy this talk very much. Sarjeet, I hand it to you. Thank you. Hi, great. Uh, thank you very much for having me over here. It's uh, fun to be here and give this talk in person. Uh, so this is some work I've been involved in for the last year or so with my collaborator, uh, David Kaplan. Uh, so I'll tell you the story, where we are in terms of the theory and where we are in terms of experimental uh, progress as well. So what we're going to talk about is trying to modify quantum mechanics itself. Specifically, I'm going to try to introduce nonlinear evolution in quantum mechanics and talk about how that can be done in a causal way and talk about experimental tests of that idea. So the question you may ask is why? Why would someone want to modify quantum mechanics? We think about why there's motivation to modify quantum mechanics. Basically, um, the whole story of quantum mechanics is that a bunch of people got together in a conference in 1911 or 1912 or something like that, and looked at a lot of very confusing experimental data and came up with a bunch of rules and said, look, these are the rules. Uh, most of those guys didn't even believe those rules themselves. Right? There was a lot of controversy, as you undoubtedly know, on what these rules were supposed to mean. So why should we think that a bunch of rules that were put down in the 1912s in some conference is absolutely correct, that it could never be modified, right? I've been in lots of conferences, and uh, most of the rules I got in those conferences uh, rarely lost the conference itself. So if you think about trying to modify quantum mechanics, one should ask, what are the postulates of quantum mechanics that one might try to modify? There are really just two postulates of quantum mechanics on which everything else can be built. The first is that probability is a fundamental aspect of quantum mechanics, and you can never get rid of it in some sense. And the second is linearity. Time evolution in quantum mechanics is linear. So which of these should one go after? There's a long history of people trying to modify quantum mechanics by trying to get rid of probability. In my opinion, that is not likely to succeed. Why is quantum mechanics probabilistic? What is the fundamental reason behind it? This is because of two I would argue fundamental fa facts about the world, experimentally known facts about the world. The first is that if you take a finite system, like say some atom, and you set some energy in the atom, right? And you basically ask how many energy levels are there below that given energy? So I'm basically saying there's a hydrogen atom. Let me pick some energy, okay? 25 EV. And ask how many energy levels are there below that? The answer is there's a finite number of energy levels below that, right? If you don't have that, you won't have sensible thermodynamics. So that's a fact about the world. The second fact about the world is that we have continuous observables and symmetries of the world. Also true. So I'm going to argue to you that if these two facts are actually true, and if you wanted to have every observable in the system to be completely deterministic at all time, I'm going to claim that these three facts don't play well with each other. Let's see why. Let's ask a simple question. If I have a hydrogen atom, could the electron and the hydrogen atom have a well-defined position? So when I was a child, my idea of the electron and the atom was that it went around the, the proton, like in a solar system style model, right? Like the earth going around the sun, where the earth has a well-defined position at all times. So suppose it was in fact true that the electron actually had a well-defined position around the proton, and that was a sensible energy level. If that was the case, I can apply a rotation to this particular system, that particular state. And I would then get another state where the electron has another well-defined position around the atom and has a well-defined energy. Rotation is a continuous symmetry of the world, which means I cannot just get these two states, but I can get a continuous degeneracy of such states at all times. Right? So 
by simply this argument, you realize that if I actually had these two things, I wanted these two postulates to be true, facts about the world to be true, it, there could be no way in which the electron could continually have a continuously well-defined position around the electron, uh, around the proton at all times. So quantum mechanics is basically a compromise. It sacrifices the notion of absolute determinism for all variables at all times in order to preserve a finite set of energy states for the system and also have continuous symmetries and observables. Okay. Now, there are varieties of ways in which we have proven quantum mechanics, Bell inequalities, Koch and Specker theorems, the SSC theorems, things of this kind. If you fundamentally ask, how do they go ahead and prove that the world is fundamentally quantum mechanical, is that they're basically playing off these facts against each other. So if you think about tests of, of the Bell inequality, what do you normally do? You consider a number of states of angular momentum, okay? And you only have a finite number of those. And then rotations, of course, you can apply in arbitrary ways. So you basically say, look, let me look at a few angular momentum states and let me try to measure the angular momentum states along different axes. And eventually you run into a contradiction if you insist that all of the angular momenta are well-defined in all directions, precisely because of the fact that you have a finite system and you're trying to measure that in a large number of ways. So if you try to eliminate probability from quantum mechanics, you've got to fight these two facts. And I think it's very, very hard to fight them. So I won't try to do that. The next question is linearity. That's the second posture of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is linear, which really just means that the wave function of quantum mechanics does not interact with itself, okay? What does that mean for practical low energy people? Okay, what does that mean? Uh, let's look at the hydrogen atom. If you take a proton and you have the electron around it, there are the 2s and 2p levels of hydrogen. And in linear quantum mechanics, these two things are extremely degenerate. Okay, the, the, the degeneracy is only broken at the level of the lamp shift, something like that. Now, if you think about it, right, if you think about why these two things are very degenerate, it's, it's a bit puzzling. So, Naively, one might want to say the 2s and the 2p levels of hydrogen are, of course, some kind of charge distribution, right? That's what it is. There's some charge distribution. If you think about the problem very, very classically, you would expect that, look, if I have a charge sphere, you know, I would expect the charge sphere to talk to itself through electromagnetic interactions. There's a dumbbell. The dumbbell should talk to itself via some electromagnetic interactions. And naively, from a very classical perspective, you would have expected a contribution to the energy levels of the 2s and 2p levels of hydrogen that depended on the shape of the orbital. But that doesn't exist, right? Which is why these two things are very degenerate, even though the shapes are very different from each other. But of course, there's no fundamental rule of nature that basically argues that, look, I can never sense the shape of the orbital. That's just not true. If I put a second electron around this atom, that second electron clearly sees the shape. If you put the 2s guy, right, the nuclear charge is much better screened by the 2s level than the 2p level, right? So there is no fundamental reason why the shape of the electron cloud could not be sensed by another particle. So the question becomes, why can't the electron sense itself? Why should that be some deep reason why that can't happen? So what are the challenges in trying to come up with a nonlinear theory? A nonlinear theory meaning the electron wave function sees itself, right? What are the challenges? And the main challenge will be causality, okay? That's what blocked people before, and we'll try to see how to get around that particular problem. Then we've got to talk about other things like measurement, you know, how do you think about measurement in this theory? How does all of this fit into quantum field theory? When you add relativity. Relativity, exactly. So here is the main challenge for why you might think causality and nonlinearity don't play well with each other. So let me write down a Schrodinger equation. So this is I d psi dt, that's a linear Hamiltonian you're used to. And now I've added some nonlinear piece, this epsilon, psi square, psi star square. Okay. For a single particle theory, that's fine. You know, there's just some new nonlinear term. Go ahead and solve it. Big deal. Okay. There's, no, there, there's nothing wrong for, as far as that theory is concerned, as long as I'm only describing single particles. The fundamental fact about quantum mechanics, though, is that you have to be able to describe more than one particle in the world. And when you describe more than one particle in the world, you have to consider entangled states. Right. So generically, I could think about a two particle state with one particle at X, another particle at Y, and that guy has some complicated entangled state like this. And your Schrodinger equation is supposed to tell you how to time evolve that complicated state as well. What can go wrong in this case? Well, imagine the following operation, right? I take two particles, X and Y, one is at X and the other is at Y or whatever. I create an entangled state here on the Earth. And let me take one particle, retain it on the Earth, and take the other guy and go all the way to Mars, okay? 
I go to Mars and I perform some local operation on the particle at Mars, okay, some local unitary operation. I did something to it over there. Now, in linear quantum mechanics, that's fine. Everything evolves perfectly nicely. But in nonlinear quantum mechanics, what you see now is that because this time evolution now depends upon terms like psi square and psi star square, right? If you're going to take this particular state and you apply some local unitary operation, these coefficients will now change, right? You apply a unitary operation, the alpha i will all rotate with each other. When they have changed that way, you have now changed the coefficients that live in this particular expression. And that means when you perform a local operation in Mars, the coefficients that govern the time evolution of the particle at y, which is the particle that you have on the Earth right now, will instantly change, right? That's what that Schrodinger equation is telling you. When, I, when you have psi squared and psi star squared, when you change the coefficients of x, it also changes the coefficients of y. And changing the coefficients of y mean I've instantly realized, look, something has happened in Mars. I've got instantaneous communication, right? That is why uh, you have to be careful about how to introduce nonlinearity in quantum mechanics. Your theory will break causality if you don't do it carefully. So this particular expression I wrote down, this term will in fact give rise to a causal behavior. But it's not like a causality is a fundamental aspect of nonlinearity. We of course know plenty of classical nonlinear theories where causality is fine. And if you think about all of those theories, the way causality is enforced is via some kind of Green's function, right? You change some guy somewhere, there's a field that propagates via some Green's function, and that takes care of causality. You do it sensibly, it works sensibly. So why should causality and nonlinearity be so deeply tied together? One should be able to make it work. So here comes the main set of ideas that actually make our work possible. The first is that linear quantum mechanics is basis independent, by which I mean you can take your linear quantum mechanical Hamiltonian eigenfunctions, whatever it is, choose whatever basis you want. Because the uh, theory is linear, you can describe the theory any way you want. It all perfectly makes sense. However, there's a fact about the world, which is that if you think about how particles talk to each other, okay, they happen through local interactions, which means they care about position. I see Ron sit right here, right? I don't see Ron spread around as a gigantic wave function all around the universe. And that is precisely because of the fact that the way I'm observing Ron is through optical photons hitting us each other, and they care about position. So linear quantum mechanics is basis independent, but in the real world, there's a preferred basis, which is position picked by the Hamiltonian. So position basis is actually very interesting because if you think about field theory, right? That's how you write field theory, right? That's preferentially in the position basis. And uh, if you have problems with causality, Okay, which is what nonlinearity already had problems with, you might want to think about the position basis as being appropriate because causality at the end of the day is all about position. It's about knowing where in space and time something happens. So instead of trying to formulate a general nonlinear quantum mechanical evolution, let's think about how we can focus specifically on formulating a sensible theory in the position basis, okay? which naturally tells you that the language you want to use is quantum field theory because quantum field theory is formulated in position basis. Secondly, the problems that we had came from multi-particle states, right? That's where all the nonlinearities and causality issues came up. Quantum field theory is designed to handle multi-particle states in a causal way. That's why it was formulated that way. Finally, I would say, who cares about the Schrodinger equation that we normally use in non-relativistic quantum mechanics? What we really care about at the end of the day is quantum field theory because that's actually what describes the world. So somehow if I describe everything in quantum field theory to begin with, all of these problems could simultaneously be solved. So I'm gonna take a somewhat different attitude than we normally take. So usually we think of the Schrodinger equation and linear quantum mechanics as some overall you know, general framework. And then quantum field theory is simply an application of that overall framework into relativistic systems. That's how we have historically viewed quantum field theory. But I would say, if you want to introduce nonlinearity, there's a reason to actually make quantum field theory structure much more grander and global than we currently view it. So I'm gonna start everything with quantum field theory and see how to do this. Okay, that's the motivation of our goal. So here is the outline for the rest of the talk. I will give you the overall field theory picture just to tell you how it all fits. And we'll talk about the specific one particle quantum mechanical uh, evolution after that. We'll discuss how causality and measurement work. Uh, Nonlinear quantum mechanics will turn out to have some truly completely insane macroscopic effects, okay? 
So the first part of the talk, you will think I'm a reasonably sane guy. Then I get to number two, you'll think this guy is completely crazy. Okay. And then we'll talk about how my complete craziness can be tested uh, and how much current constraints on these theories actually apply. Uh, and then we'll talk about how nonlinear quantum mechanics is extremely sensitive to certain aspects of cosmology that we really cannot control, which is a very, very crucial part of the story. And then I'll conclude. So here's the framework, okay? So as I said, I'm gonna start with quantum field theory and I will, uh, since this is not a field theory audience, I'll just give you the overall idea of how to do it, okay? So what is quantum field theory? It's actually not that different from your regular one particle quantum mechanics that you're, that you're dealing with. What I think, actually, and probably many of you may be even familiar with some of these words, right? So what you're really trying to do in quantum field theory is that you take a quantum state, which is a state of quantum field, some kind of Fox state, right? That you create with creation and annihilation operators. And then your uh, 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 particles, they are actually some fields, phi of x, that's what they are. So the way you wanna think about this is basically the sky is some kind of a vector, okay, in Hilbert space, and the phi are some kind of matrices in Hilbert space. And then you construct a Hamiltonian, which is now some integral over all space, okay, because these operators are living at every point in space. And you construct a Hamiltonian, which is now a function of these operators and their conjugate momenta. So really all you want to think is that this Hamiltonian is just your regular matrix. This matrix just has different values at different points in space, or rather the different matrices at different points in space. They're just operators, regular operators. That's all it is. And even in quantum field theory, what you're actually fundamentally doing is solving the Schrodinger equation. I d psi dt, I d chi dt equal to h chi. It is just that your states are now these complicated uh, quantum Fox space states that you created. And the Hamiltonian is now this uh, you know, complicated Hamiltonian uh, where it changes at every point in X, okay, with a different sort of matrices. So it's just a standard stuff that you're thinking about. H is an operator, it's a matrix, the chi are just vectors. That's all you're doing in quantum field theory too. Now, I'm gonna do something a little bit different here, which is that I'm gonna say that, look, I can derive this particular equation from this action. So this is not the usual action of quantum field theory that people often use. Uh, usually this action doesn't give you anything useful, okay? Uh, I'm doing it just because it allows me to introduce nonlinearity in a very natural way. So here's my claim. If I take this particular action, okay, where this is a Hamiltonian that I have here, and I've taken expectation values of this Hamiltonian on these states, chi like this, you can convince yourself that if you look at this action and you demand that the equation of motion for the time evolution of this quantum state minimizes this action, you get the Euler-Lagrange procedure, which then gives you the Schrodinger equation. So I haven't done anything useful, right? I've simply said, look, I can, I can get the Schrodinger equation from this action, that's all. Just a way of formulate, formulating it. So let me focus specifically on a specific theory like the Yukawa theory. The Yukawa theory is basically a theory of a fermion interacting with a scalar field phi. That's all it is. So the way you introduce that is by basically send, sending phi, psi bar psi, phi is my scalar field, psi are the fermions, and y is a Yukawa coupling, okay? That's just what it is. And this is just an example. This is an example, exactly, this is an example, okay, of how to do this. So let me write down the action that I wrote down in the previous slide, which is now saying, oh, the equation of motion comes from minimizing this action, okay, the path of minimum action in, in Hilbert space or whatever. And so let me look at how this Yukawa coupling enters this particular action. So the Yukawa coupling is now part of this Hamiltonian. And so all I have done now is basically saying chi H chi, the, that expectation value that I've taken there, right? So if you think about it, that's just a number, right? This, this H is a matrix. Uh, the chi is a column vector. This other chi is a row vector. So I got a number out of it. That's all I'm doing. So how does the Yukawa coupling fit in? Well, I put in this guy, stick it in here. So this becomes a Y phi psi bar psi, and I take the chi in here, right? So it's just a very simple operation here. What you see now is basically a product of matrices, phi of x, psi bar psi, and a chi sitting on either side, giving you a number. That's all it is. Now, for the last 100 years, what we have been doing is studying various operators that could live here. So for example, the Yukawa theory just has a single phi, psi bar psi, but obviously I could put in a phi squared, psi bar psi, right? Uh, if you're familiar with people looking for uh, the electric dipole moment of the electron, uh, you know, that's a different theory than this, but they're just looking for higher dimension operators. That's what you're looking for, right? So for the last 100 years, we have happily added, okay, non-linearities in the operators, but not in the states. So I can put in any power of phi I want here and go look for it. Nobody think, will, will think you're crazy, 
right? That's a perfectly reasonable thing we've been doing. But the number of chi's that appear in this action is always two. There's one chi here, one chi here. That's just linear quantum mechanics. Now, if you look at that structure, though, it's very natural for you to see how you could introduce a nonlinearity because I can just take this action, okay? Chi, phi, psi bar, psi, chi. The only requirement of this action is that it should be a number. So I've got some matrix in the middle and I've taken an inner product with a column and a row vector that gave me a number. Looking at that structure, it is very natural to think, well, why can't I split up this product of matrices in this way? I can put a chi, phi, chi, that's a number, and a chi, psi bar, psi, chi, that's also a number. So that's now a product of two numbers. So I can essentially look at any particular interacting operator that I have in quantum mechanics and split it up in this particular way by putting in these chi's in the middle. That also gives me a number. It obeys all the usual rules of quantum field theory. There's nothing particularly unusual about it. This is now higher order in states because I've got more than one chi appearing in the action. But otherwise, I can't see anything obviously wrong with it, right? So this just leads to state dependent quantum evolution. And what we're gonna do is to understand what kind of physics this might lead to, I'm gonna treat it all perturbatively, okay? So I'm gonna think of epsilon as a small number and ask how can this epsilon be, the physics of the epsilon be understood? So let's just look at a single particle theory, okay? So what I now have is a fermion psi, like an electron, and this guy is interacting with a uh, phi particle, which is a boson, okay? This is the Yukawa theory. What does this quantum field theory in this nonlinear way look like? So again, my prescription is that I take the action that I wrote down in the previous slide and ask what is the path of minimum action that gives me the new Schrodinger equation. And the new Schrodinger equation will now contain, okay, this extra piece. So previously it was just y phi psi bar psi, that's the usual Yukawa theory. Now I've got this epsilon times the expectation value of chi phi chi living in there, just from what I said. And I'm simply going to evolve using the new Schrodinger equation I've got. It's just that the Hamiltonian is now different. It depends upon the state itself. So how do we do perturb perturbation theory on this? Well, at zeroth order, how you start off, that's just fine. That's just regular quantum field theory. There is no funny business. So at zeroth order, you take your fermions, you go ahead and you calculate everything. Okay, great, you know how to do that. To compute the first order correction, all I need to know is basically the zeroth order solution here, right? So I use regular quantum field theory to compute how the states evolve. Once I have found the answer in regular quantum field theory, I can compute that expectation value in regular quantum field theory, which has now given me the term I need to put into my first order correction. And I can use that to compute the first order correction. We know how to do that because the way this is entering into the theory is just like a background field. So all of you ha undoubtedly have done this in AMO where you sometimes think of a laser field as some semi-classical background field, right? You don't worry about the quantum mechanics of it. You just say, look, this is just some classical field. Let me put that in there and analyze how my atom responds to it. Or magnetic field. Magnetic field, yeah, any of those things. Everybody knows how to do this, right? The crucial point you learn is basically that because this is now simply a background field, it is extremely well-defined. There aren't going to be strange new inconsistencies that are gonna show up because I'm just doing semi-classical computations now. The mathematics doesn't know that this came from, a, from the state itself, right? So it's all very, very sensible that way. So we can now see why causality works, okay? So essentially the idea is that if I wanna do this process perturbatively, at every order in the perturbation theory, I simply know, need to know the state to the previous order. And all of that is well-defined computations. And the way it appears in computing the nth order term is via a background field, which you again know how to do. So perturbation theory just carries you all the way over, order by order. Now we can see why the theory is causal explicitly because at zeroth order, at order epsilon equal to zero, right? What I'm computing here is the expectation value of phi, this field phi. That is an observable of quantum field theory. Right? If I take a scalar field phi, I can find its expectation value. Quantum field theory guarantees that at the zeroth order, this expectation value, of course, is causal. So if I take two systems and I you know, go to Mars or do whatever, I'll basically be asking this question, okay, I take these two systems, one guy is here, the other guy goes to Mars, I do some operation in Mars. For that to affect me, it has to affect me to the expectation value of this phi field. But that comes with a propagator, right? It comes with this Green's function that will tell me, oh, when I do something in Mars, how does that affect me on the Earth? The field phi has to change causally, right? 
So quantum field theory guarantees that at zeroth order, this guy will be causal. Once it's causal at the zeroth order, of course, you're using that causal guy to now compute the first order correction, which again, you're again using the standard rules of quantum field theory to compute that, which will also be causal, and so on and so forth. So order by order, this entire theory is just causal. Okay. So let's get a feel for what this thing kind of looks like, right? So um, if I have a particle phi that evolves uh, with, with this Yukawa coupling, how does the wave function evolve? Well, what are we going to do is basically uh, think about a scale, uh, some particle psi uh, at zeroth order. This is a Yukawa theory. The field psi just sources some phi field, okay? Some uh, scalar field around it. I can go ahead and compute its expectation value. No big deal. What does the computation look like? Well, if you have a particle psi, right? That psi has some wave function around it. And now I compute the expectation value of the uh, scalar field phi sourced by the psi particle. And that is just some simple computation. You basically say, look, I can think of the psi as contributing some charge density, psi star psi, right? And this psi star psi will give rise to some phi field that I'm just classically calculating after that. Very simple to do. And that's the formula for it. Uh, it basically looks like psi star psi with this Green's function that sits out there, which is ultimately what's going to make this whole thing call. And uh, then you put that back into your, uh, you know, uh, 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 single particle time evolution, where you say, look, I've now computed this, that is this computation, psi star psi times this Green's function, and that tells you how the particle evolves, All right? Now, this is, of course, an interesting fact here, because in this way of doing business, the way the nonlinearity enters the theory depends upon the field theory you started from, right? So for example, the Yukawa theory gives you this particular kind of nonlinearity. If I started with a different kind of theory, like lambda phi to the fourth, the various field theories one could write down, the way the nonlinearity enters will be different because it always appears by me first modifying the quantum field theory to start with and introducing the nonlinearity there. So this is not a universal form of the uh, nonlinearity for the single particle level. Uh, it all comes from the field theory itself. It's quite different from how you normally think about it. But now you can compute this, right? So if I take a proton and I'd say fix it at a particular location and say the electrons in this particular nonlinear world had this phi interaction. And then what you will now find is that if you compute the 2s and 2p levels of hydrogen in this particular model, because the electron is now talking to itself via this phi interaction, there will be a contribution to the energy levels of 2s and 2p that depend upon the specific shape of the wave function. Okay, you've broken nonlinearity in quantum, I mean, you've introduced nonlinearity. Okay, and you can prove various things from this that uh, the Hermitian form of this Hamiltonian preserves probabilities and all this kind of stuff. So, all the usual things you're used to in uh, doing uh, quantum mechanics can all be shown to be true in this particular example as well. So, let me specifically talk about entangled states and how, it, uh, how causality is preserved. So, I've got this guy, you know, uh, a complicated entangled state, something here, something in Mars. Uh, again, the way the entangled state is going to evolve is basically I take my entangled state, particle psi. I mean, let's say I have one part of one electron here, the other electron is in Mars. And now I go to Mars and I perform some operation. The way the operation in Mars can affect me is that whatever I'm doing to that particle in Mars, shaking it, whatever it is, it has to change the expectation value of phi on the ground here. So it has to causally propagate. That's how the quantum field theory automatically comes in. And so if you compute that expression, you basically will find that the way these particles affect each other is to some kind of additive process here, right? You see that, you know, this is the Green's function idea that if you do something here in Mars, that guy can affect me, okay? So that is this particle at X1 will affect the particle at X, which is whatever is over there, plus the particle at Y, so on and so forth. This is an additive form of these Green's functions. So I, the only reason why I put that out here is because of some history. Uh, Weinberg famously tried to modify quantum mechanics nonlinearly in the late 1980s. And uh, Joe Poshinsky showed that the specific modification that Weinberg had suggested was actually a causal. Okay. And what Poshinsky said is that uh, uh, from very general arguments, he basically said, look, not all nonlinearities need to be a causal. They have to appear in a specific way. So what Poshinsky specifically showed is that if you, the, the nonlinearities were multiplicative, that was, remember my very first slide, I had some terms like psi squared plus psi star squared. Those were multiplicative. Polchinski showed that those kinds of things were actually a causal. What he said, if the way the nonlinearities talk to each other is in this kind of additive form, okay, where something I do here only affects me in some additive way in this way, 
he said that would actually be causal. He was able to prove that. What we find is that the additive form demanded by Pochinsky is extremely natural in field theory. I don't have to work to guess it, it just naturally pops up. Okay, so that's one of the reasons why we like it. So let's talk about measurement, all right? Now, uh, I mean, this is an interesting th thing because I didn't realize how many physicists have uh, strong opinions about this field. Uh, uh, but in my opinion, uh, measurements are not some mystery that we don't know how to talk about, right? We've understood measurement for a long time. Uh, what are we doing in a measurement? We're simply taking a quantum state and bringing that in contact with a measuring device is also another quantum state. These two guys are interacting with each other through a Hamiltonian, okay, that you pick. And then you just do the Schrodinger equation, which allows, which predicts that this combination will evolve into this linear superposition. That's just what the Schrodinger equation predicts, right? So you take this quantum state and it becomes this co complicated entangled combination. I would say the prediction of quantum mechanics and uh, the idea is basically that, well, if you create this very complicated entangled state, if this is some macroscopic system, it is extremely hard for you to recover quantum coherence because you have to change the full macroscopic system, which you're unable to do, okay? So effectively, if you're only going to introduce, uh, think about the physics of the uh, state I, which is the quantum state here, then you can think of this essentially as a superposition, as a, as a sum of distinct worlds where some outcomes came out, right? So this is the many world interpretation of quantum mechanics. And apparently that, that is a, a, a complicated story. I mean, people are, think it's controversial, okay? But uh, for me, it's always made sense. So this will be central to our story because I think this is a prediction of quantum mechanics. You may not believe it, but at that point, you don't believe quantum mechanics. What do we do in nonlinear quantum mechanics? Nothing different, right? Uh, measurement is still the interaction between a quantum state and a quantum system. And uh, uh, as a measuring device. So you still do the same thing. You bring these two guys in contact with each other, time evolves, this is what, this is what will happen. Just prediction from that, okay? There is an interesting difference between nonlinear quantum mechanics and linear quantum mechanics, which is that in, in, in linear quantum mechanics, if you want to design a nice measuring device, right? By nice measuring device, what I mean is that, okay, this particular spin could be spin up or spin down. And if it is spin up, I want the dial to go to the left. If it's spin down, I want the dial to go to the right. Right? You, you, you want to create a nice measuring device like that, where the spin to the left, so sorry, the dial to the left and the dial to the right are orthogonal to each other. That's what you want for a good measuring device. You don't need to know anything about the actual quantum state you're trying to measure to design such a Hamiltonian. All you need to know is basically what are the basis vectors of your spin? What are the basis vectors of your measuring device? Once you know those two things, you can construct interactions between them that will guarantee this kind of outcome. You can do that, right? But in nonlinear quantum mechanics, you can't do that because in nonlinear quantum mechanics, the time evolution between these two systems depends upon the quantum state itself. And since you don't know what the quantum state is, that's why you're trying to measure it, right? You can't design a, a, an interaction between them that will always guarantee that, these, uh, that this uh, interaction gives rise to a nice superposition where all the states are orthogonal to each other. You can't do that in general. Right? You will find that the time evolution gives rise to some complicated uh, combination here where uh, you know, there's some error, if you will, right? that your state was actually this, but your measuring device did that, basically because of the fact that the states are interacting with each other in some complicated way. So there's a fundamental notion of measurement noise in this system. Okay? So all of this has been somewhat theoretical, but hopefully you got the idea of how uh, this works. And now let me get to the part where you think I'm crazy. Okay? Oh, actually not yet. Uh, that's the next slide. But you think I'm crazy. So the thing I want to say is basically that uh, all the discussions so far have been around, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a Yukawa theory. But uh, you know, you can also introduce all this into gravitation and electromagnetism by pretty much the same idea. All you're basically going to do is you're going to take uh, some interaction in your theory, replace that by expectation values, and the same idea kind of ports over. So I won't spend too much time on this, but I'm happy to talk to anyone who's interested. But just to know that it actually works for other in theories as well. All right, macroscopic effects, the place where you think I'm crazy, right? Is, I mean, usually what I say is that uh, people may think that I've been crazy during the pandemic, but uh, Ron has known me for a long time and he knows I've been crazy for much longer than the pandemic, okay? So let's talk about these macroscopic effects. And in fact, these macroscopic, the craziness here doesn't really come from me. It doesn't even really come from my particular theory. It really just comes from quantum mechanics itself, okay? So we'll see what how. So let's look at a very simple example. Linear quantum mechanics, okay? Suppose I have a spin, 
uh, and I spin, let's say I place that along the X direction. I now have an experimentalist and let me now have a laser with two photo detectors. Okay, very simple system. And uh, your quantum state of the universe now contains all of these three guys, right? It contains the spins, it contains the human being doing the experiment and it contains the photo detectors and all these kinds of things. We're gonna create a macroscopic superposition. I'm not trying to create a quantum coherent macroscopic superposition. I'm gonna just create a macroscopic superposition. That is very easy to do because all you need to do now is measure the spin along the y direction. And depending upon the outcome, you're gonna send the laser along different directions. So how does that work? So let me take my spin along X and measure along Y. Half the time I'll get spin up along Y, okay? If I got spin up, I'll now send, oh, I got spin up, send the laser to the top. If I get spin down, send the laser to the right, okay? Now, this is where the many worlds part of it comes, comes in. There is no collapse of the wave function, right? What's actually, what's the prediction of quantum mechanics is that the full quantum state now is basically the spin was measured to be up, the laser went to the top, and then you got entangled with some environment to the top, plus spin went down, laser went to the right, and, the, and you got entangled with some environment to the right. That is a prediction of quantum mechanics, okay? That's just what linear quantum mechanics predicts for you. You've created this trivial macroscopic superposition. Now you can ask, okay, which of these photo detectors light up? In linear quantum mechanics, this is very straightforward. You basically say, okay, clearly in this guy, the laser to the top will write up and this guy, the laser to the right will write up. That's what happens, right? And uh, why is that? So normally it's because you can compute some kind of transition matrix element. We are basically asking, let me go here. I'm asking, well, does this electron light up or not? Well, what's really happening is that this electron is sensitive to the electromagnetic field at that particular location. The, the, the electromagnetic field operator, of course, lives across the full superposition. But what's really happening is that because in this particular world, the environment is all tied up over here, when I compute the transition matrix element, I'll find that that's actually zero, right? So if I specifically compute the transition matrix element of the electromagnetic field at the right location, XR, uh, entangled with this environment of the laser bent to the top, that transition matrix element is zero, which is why formally this photo detector does not light up. That's the mathematics behind it. But notice this, in linear quantum mechanics itself, if I simply compute the expectation value of the electromagnetic field operator, since the full quantum state exists, right? I have the full quantum state is laser bent to the top plus laser bent to the bottom, uh, uh, to, 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 like, to, to, to the right, sorry. If you compute the expectation value of the electromagnetic field, no matter which environment I'm in, both the value of the electromagnetic field at the top and to the right are non-zero, right? Because what's happening is that when you compute this expectation value, since both these states exist, right? The fact that this guy exists means that when you compute the expectation value in whichever world you're in, you will still get a non-zero answer in linear quantum mechanics. Of course, linear quantum mechanics, the fact that the expectation value is non-zero doesn't help you because theory is linear, can't do anything with it. Now what happens is that I have now introduced this expectation value as sitting in front of the Hamiltonian explicitly. Okay, so in both these worlds, that expectation value is now non-zero, okay? Which means that you will now find that in the world where the laser went to the top, you ask, does a photo detector to the right light up? At order epsilon, it will, because at order epsilon, it is now sensitive to the electromagnetic field in this world, because both these worlds exist. Right? That's what nonlinearity is doing. It's allowing, allowing one part of the wave function to talk to the other part of the wave function. So this again is something that Polchinski realized would be true in his uh, framework. He basically said, look, you could make uh, quantum mechanics uh, uh, nonlinear and make it causal. And if you did that, there would be this very weird thing where if you look at the many worlds of Everett, those many worlds can talk to each other. As bizarre, okay, completely bizarre, but I don't think it's logically inconsistent. Just weird. So let's think about constraints and tests of this theory. Okay, let's begin with, with the lamp shift. Okay, what does this do to the lamp shift? I started this whole thing by the, by the following statement. If I take a proton, okay, and I have the electron around it, uh, the 2s and 2p levels, because the wave function is interacting with itself, there would clearly be a big split in the levels between them. And we've measured the lamp shift to like 13 digits. 
right? So how constrained is this theory? Now, it is certainly true that if I take the proton and fix it to a point, and I look at the 2s and 2p levels of, the pro, uh, 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 of that particular atom, they would be very split at order epsilon. But that is not how you do your experiment. You don't take your proton and fix it to a location. You put your proton in some trap, and then you're trying to measure how the energies are, are being measured. Right? It's similar to the kind of experiment that you did wrong. Very, very important difference between linear and nonlinear quantum mechanics. Extremely important. In linear quantum mechanics, let's think about the very simple problem of the energy levels of hydrogen. How do you solve that problem? The first thing you do when, they go, when you go to class is basically the professor will tell you, jump to the center of mass coordinates. When you jump to center of mass coordinates, you decouple the center of mass degrees of freedom from the relative coordinate, right? And then because those two things are decoupled, you never care about the center of mass degrees of freedom ever. You just simply find the energy by measuring the, uh, by just computing the relative coordinate. What this operationally means is that if I give you a hydrogen atom that is, let's say, spread, physically spread, its wave function is physically spread over one micron in a trap, versus a hydrogen atom that I spread over the size of the galaxy, if I ask, what is the ionization energy of these two very different quantum mechanical states? The answer is the same, 13.6 EV, right? Because the center of mass degree of freedom does not matter. That's fine for linear quantum mechanics, but not in nonlinear quantum mechanics. In nonlinear quantum mechanics, what appears now is the expectation value of the electromagnetic field. And that absolutely cares how your wave function is spread. So if I take a, a hydrogen atom, and I'm trying to compute this expectation value, and I trap it into a one micron trap versus the size of the galaxy, right? When I, when I take the same guy and spread it the size of the galaxy, that expectation value is now massively damped, right? So this is a very interesting fact, and it actually caught us by surprise because when we started this project, we thought, oh my God, all these AMO guys must have really, really good limits on nonlinear quantum mechanics. Turns out, no, because all of the experiments that have been done so far in all these things, you don't care about the spread of the wave function. It's never occurred to you to check that, right? And that is, of course, fine for linear quantum mechanics, but in nonlinear quantum mechanics, absolutely no. Okay? And it's very funny, right? Because your standard instinct to go and test quantum mechanics is to do it in atomic and nuclear systems, because that is basically where we learned quantum mechanics in the first place. So you want to be like, let me go test those very, very carefully. But if you're not careful about how localized the systems were, they were not actually good tests. So if you look at the lamp shift, Naively, you would have thought epsilon should be 10 to the minus 13, 14, something incredibly small. But let's think about the hydrogen atom itself, right? Hydrogen atom is electrically neutral, right? So if you take the expectation value of the electromagnetic field in the hydrogen atom, that's actually zero, right? Because if you, if you take your hydrogen atom and you put it in a micron-sized trap, the hydrogen atom is like wobbling all over the place in that trap. And now you say, how does the electron feel the, itself? It feels itself through the electro expectation value of the electromagnetic field, but the expectation value of the electromagnetic field for neutral hydrogen atom is zero. So the lamp shift does not constrain this theory to 10 to the minus 13. It constrains it to order one. That's it. People have done these sorts of lamp shift experiments with ions where the expectation value doesn't go to zero. But once again, they have not been careful about localizing these things. And so once again, if you look at the numbers there, the epsilon is more like 10 to the minus two. That's insane, right? You think quantum mechanics, linearity, we have tested it so well, but no. Okay, so you're in this very interesting regime where none of the current bounds really apply. Okay, and the leading constraint we could think of is basically something completely accidental, which is that people have been able to trap ions. So if you think about epsilon and epsilon is positive, so you end up getting a repulsive interaction. The fact that you were able to trap an ion says epsilon is less than 10 to the minus five because the ion will now feel its own, it's, feel itself, right? There's a Coulomb repulsion of the ion in itself. And, and the fact that you've been able to localize the ion and trap it in, a, in some ion trap makes epsilon less than 10 to the minus five if the uh, 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 interaction is repulsive. If epsilon is negative, so it is attractive, that would just simply mean the ion is more deeply trapped. And we've never really understood that very well, right? Like we haven't probed it, okay? So there aren't really good limits on any of these kinds of things so far. That's very, very interesting. But it's not somehow that this system is difficult to test, right? Uh, let me take, tell you about a few experiments that are ongoing right now. So one class of experiments is to create macroscopic superpositions 
and look for the expectation values in this particular process. So here is an a version of an experiment that Alex Sushkov is doing at Boston. So here's the idea. You take some kind of a spin, okay? And you do the same thing, spin up, spin down, right? You split the universe like this. And here's what you do. You take a squid and a, and a magnet and a magnetic field. So what you do is that if you got spin up, let's say from 10 a.m. to 10, 10 a.m., you turn on a magnetic field. And from 10, 10 to 10, 20, you turn off the magnetic field. If you got spin down, you turn off the magnetic field from 10 to 10, 10, and then you turn it on from 10, 10 to 10, 20. In linear quantum mechanics, great. From 10 to 10, 10, in this world, you'll get the B field. It'll be off after that. In this world, it'll be opposite. In nonlinear quantum mechanics, what you will then say is basically, well, let me go to this part of the wave function where between 10, 10 to 10, 20, the B field was off. Do I now see some magnetic field from the other part of the wave function sneaking in? At order epsilon, right? That's what you can test for. So Alex is doing a version of this uh, using uh, uh, electric fields rather than magnetic fields. You can do similar tests for gravity. Jason Hogan is going to do this, where what you do is uh, something very similar. You take a spin, you know, spin up, spin down. You have a nice accelerometer, and then you have a mass next to you, and you basically say between 10 o'clock and 10:10, I'm going to bring this mass next to me. Between 10:10 and 10:20, I'm going to take it away. In the other world, you do the opposite. And what you're looking for is basically whether the mass in the other world at order epsilon is now interacting with your accelerometer. Right? It's a similar kind of idea, just with accelerometers and masses. Right? And for all we know, this epsilon could be order one right? for gravity. Uh, Hartmut is doing something much more traditional at Berkeley, which is the idea that you could uh, take an ion interferometer and you can split the ion okay, into, into like two different parts, right? The probability, I mean, some you know, coefficient p and square root of one minus p squared. And in linear quantum mechanics, these two arms of the interferometer don't talk to each other, right? But in the nonlinear quantum mechanics we're talking about, the Coulomb field of this guy will now affect this guy. So you're now going to get a phase shift in your interferometer that depends upon the value of p, right? This doesn't exist in linear quantum mechanics at all. So, Given that you now have this intensity dependent phase shift, that should hopefully help you beat standard systematics because th those things don't care about P at all. So you can actually run this clock, uh, this ion interferometer with different values of P and look for effects at scale with P. So these are all things that are actually ongoing right now. Let me talk th about the final part of the talk, which is actually a, a tremendous surprise that we ran into cosmological sensitivity. Okay. Here's a fact, okay? Quantum mechanics allows you to create superpositions of entire universes, okay? The superposition exists. So I could think of a quantum state of the following kind. Alpha times U, U is basically my world where I'm sitting right now giving the stock, all the stuff. Plus beta times some other world, okay? Some other world meaning that at this point in space and time, I'm not here, the world is not here, nothing is here. It's a completely different universe, right? None of this stuff actually exists in that quantum state. You can think about, I mean, that's true in, in linear quantum mechanics. You, you're allowed to create such states, superpositions of the entire universe, right? Remember, I'm a many worlds guy, I'm nuts. But in linear quantum mechanics, you never worry about whether the val what the value of alpha is. You never care. You never ask this question yourself, right? What is What part of the wave function of the universe am I on? You never, you never wondered about that question. For a very simple reason, okay? In, linear th in a linear theory, if I look at the Schrodinger equation, the time evolution of the state u is the same as the time evolution of the state alpha u. So alpha never matters in any of the computations you ever do because of linearity. Not so in nonlinear quantum mechanics. In nonlinear quantum mechanics, what I'm sensitive to is the expectation value of this operator chi of, of, of amu. That's what I'm sensitive to. So if you compute that, that is basically alpha squared u amu u plus beta squared m amu m. Right? That's what it is. That's just the answer for it. What does that mean? So if Alex is going out there and doing his experiment with his magnetic field or whatever, right? The contribution of Alex to whatever he's doing, the magnetic field he's creating, et cetera, is weighted by alpha squared, right? Because Alex is now only alpha times part of the wave function. The rest of the, the, rest of the wave function is beta. So suppose whoever created the universe, just because this person was mean, made alpha 10 to the minus 500. Could have done that, right? If alpha was 10 to the minus 500, epsilon could be order one fundamentally, theoretically, okay? But all of the lab experiments we are doing will be multiplied by the 10 to the minus 500. 
because that's where Alex is sitting there creating magnetic fields and all this other stuff. So no matter what you do in the laboratory, you cannot overcome this value of alpha because the universe put you in a very small value of alpha to start with, okay? So quantum mechanics could be completely nonlinear, but all of these local experiments could give you null results simply because alpha is extremely small. That's a huge difference from linear quantum mechanics, okay? And now you can play this game. Well, can I try to make the effect bigger? Okay, I want, I want to go and give something to Ron so he can go and measure. Can I do something about it? What would I do? I could take this expectation value and divide by a projection operator that basically is conditions on me being in this universe, right? That's what you do. You want to be like, okay, let me boost this operator. Let me divide by what my world actually is. But here is a fundamental problem, right? If you want to divide and create this projection operator of the environment, yeah, we talk about it all the time. We're just like, oh, I'm conditioned myself. I'm going to go and do, do this division. But you can't actually do that at the level of an interaction in the theory because the environment is a non-local object. The environment is some stupid thing spread all over space and time. I can't write a local operator that conditions on me being in that environment. Not possible. Okay? So fundamentally, what you see is that if you also require locality, okay, you cannot boost up these effects artificially. Just not possible. All right? So uh, I think this is a very generic feature of uh, uh, any local nonlinear quantum mechanical things. So I would say to some extent, what our work has revealed is that there is a fundamental vulnerability of nonlinear quantum mechanics, which is that just because alpha happens to be small, you might spend your entire life thinking the world is linear quantum mechanics, even though it's fundamentally not. It's an emergent property of a complicated universe. Yeah, exactly, 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 exactly. It's cosmological dilution. All right. So now comes the question. This is actually very, very interesting. Standard inflationary cosmology, the, cano the canonical inflationary cosmology, predicts that alpha is extremely small. Okay. So you may have heard this stuff that basically, oh, the inflaton uh, quantum fluctuations reduce the universe, blah, 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 blah. Right. What all that blah, blah, blah means is basically that the universe where I'm sitting here and talking to you is an incredibly small part of the entire wave function of the universe. So uh, uh, that should make you feel really special, right? Like you're like 10 to the minus some, some things part of the entire universe. So if inflation happened in the canonical way, just time evolution of inflationary cosmology would effectively make quantum mechanics linear, even though it's fundamentally nonlinear. Okay, incredible fact. So does that mean all hope is lost that we could never actually discover nonlinear quantum mechanics? Turns out, no. Okay, here's a very interesting fact which is that at the end of the day, all I really care about is some expectation value of some field, okay? Now, uh, if you look at the grand universe, the expectation value of these fields will be homogeneous and isotropic. That's what we see around them. But we see time evolution around us. Things, of course, change, right? So I need to have a field which has a non-zero expectation value, even though it's homogeneous. We know of such a field, which is the metric of quantum mechanics, uh, of, the, of gravity, right? The expectation of the electromagnetic field in this mega world will be zero because I'm here creating an electromagnetic field. There's no one else at the same point in space creating another electromagnetic field, right? So the expectation value of pretty much anything you think of, uh, electromagnetism, Higgs field, not the Higgs field, uh, electrons, all those things will be zero, but the metric will be non-zero, required to be non-zero. That means what you can now do is look for the effects of this superposition of metrics, right? So this is our metric that we are used to, which is our world reacting to whatever matter I put in there. But order epsilon, I can have the expectation values of other metric coming in. And that is now non-zero, even in inflationary cosmology, okay? And that leads to very, very interesting effects, which is that if you take a regular body, okay? Like the earth or whatever, there's a Schwarzschild metric that basically describes the geometry around us. That's our world. The expectation value of the metric is basically the statement that in the, in the rest of the universe, there is no earth space, nothing at that particular point, right? There's just something empty emptiness, which means the metric of the rest of the universe is basically just the standard flat space metric at that point. So your matter fields will now respond to the sum of these two things, okay? If you do that sum, what you find is something extremely interesting, which is that if you look at how that term epsilon appears in the new effective metric you're seeing after some renormalization, it appears essentially at this order RS over R squared, where R is, R is the mass of the object or whatever. 
So this effectively appears as a second order correction to general relativity. Okay. So the leading order term, RS over R, that is this term is the standard Newtonian gravity that we're all used to. This term, RS over R here in front of dr square, that is a first order GR correction. Okay, it gives rise to the precession of the perihelion of Mercury, all this kind of stuff. This term, bizarrely, okay, only appears at order RS over R squared. So it's a second order GR correction. And that means this is only going to be visible in strong field tests of general relativity. Very weird. Right, like uh, solar system tests, none of those really matter very much because they're suppressed by huge powers of RS over R. But in strong field tests of GR, this will show up. Now, very interestingly, this is the first time in human history where we've actually had access to strong field tests of GR through experiments like LIGO. Right, so you can actually use LIGO to constrain epsilon, nonlinear quantum mechanics. So I'm very excited by this possibility. And amusingly, this also ends up solving the black hole information problem, if this is correct. Basically, what this does is that if you ask in a standard black hole story, one would basically say the horizon of the black hole is not a special point. There's nothing going on there. The reasoning for that is basically that you look at the place where, say, this part of the metric vanishes, okay, at R equal to RS. That's the same place where this point, this guy diverges. So if you take the determinant, that is something finite. When you now at order epsilon have this other guy sneaking in, what you will find is that for the effective metric, the place where this term goes to zero is no longer the place where this guy goes to infinity. So you actually end up getting a physical singularity at the scale of the horizon itself. You've made this horizon a special point. So that totally changes the whole black hole story. Okay. So uh, you create something like a firewall, you get very, very different physics. Anyway, so with that, let me conclude. Hopefully what I've convinced you is that if you look at the overall structure of quantum field theory, the overall structure of quantum field theory seems to allow for a very reasonable way for me to introduce nonlinear state dependent evolution. I look at the action that I wrote down. I'm like, there's nothing wrong with that, right? That's a very reasonable thing for me to add. And you are now in a very interesting situation where pretty much all of the conventional tests of quantum mechanics we have done in atomic and nuclear systems actually put no constraint on this. But it's very reasonable to come up with other experiments that are actually going to go and probe it. Surprisingly, we found this tremendous cosmological sensitivity which in many ways is sort of, uh, I would say, uh, the reasonableness of a scenario is the fact that you know, you're kind of understanding how, quantum, uh, how linearity of quantum mechanics is a very special point, right? Linearity, linear quantum mechanics never cared about what fraction of the wave function you were in. While nonlinear quantum mechanics is an extremely important part of the story. And depending upon how the universe was actually created, maybe you know, uh, Hartmut and Alex and uh, Jason may see something, or you've got to go and test for this in LIGO. So it's still testable. It is just that the tests are very different depending upon what the universe actually gave you. So with that, let me stop. Thank you. Uh, Ted. Yeah, but this is like the sum of these two metrics, right? No, that's right. So just the formula is correct. So really what Colleen limits is how to have to talk about an extended matrix. Yeah. And like how much curvature there is over a certain region. Right. So but that's a kind of a non that's a non-local assessment. Yes. So you have to start at the beginning that your theory is local. Yes. So I just wonder how it is that you're getting this prediction that depends on the non-local property of the gravitational field. Yes. Well, so the fact that, so the reason why, you know, you, you, what you see really is the fact that I have two different metrics that are interfering with each other, right? So you've got, so what you normally mean by this term that it is like, you know, a, a strong field is essentially in powers of RS over R. That's what you really mean. No, 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 it, it is not. It is not. That's exactly what I'm saying here, right? Because the point now is that when you have two different metrics actually interfering with each other, your underlying space-time manifold, of course, has coordinates, and everything is in reference to the underlying coordinates on the manifold. So usually in linear quantum mechanics, you are perfectly okay to just choose coordinates on one part of your wave function and talk about it that way. You can't do it here because you have a superposition. But does that mean that your theory is It is not coordinate dependent. It is not, it, no, no, it is covariant. It is, it is definitely not coordinate dependent. It's, just, it's simply the statement that if you now have two metrics on top of each other, you have to choose the same coordinate system for both of them, but you can choose any coordinate system you want. 
like you see what you, like you see what I'm getting at. It is you, you pick coordinates on the manifold. You have complete freedom to pick any coordinates you want. No, no, no. The point is this, right? That basically, if you pick that specific coordinates where nothing happens at the horizon, you can only do that for one part of your wave function, not on the other guy. There are two metrics here, right? They're both defined in the same underlying manifold, and you can pick coordinates you want on one part of your wave function, but then you have to choose the same coordinates everywhere. And only occasionally we get a mapping condition involved. Exactly. Exactly. Very unusual situation. So in GR, you, 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 don't, you never worry about it. You just say, look, I'm going to just pick whatever thing you want uh, for your universe. That's fine. Because you're not worried ever about ever having to talk to the all metric in the full uh, underlying manifold. I'm super skeptical that this is. No, it works. It works. Yes. Uh, two, two questions. One is a, maybe a clarification of what I understood from the last discussion. Yeah. So is it, is this two, the two metrics that you're talking about, it's like one in the world where there is a black hole in the universe, where yes. there is a black hole, and the other universe. There's no, there no black hole. Exactly. And in the other, in the other universe, the metric was flat, and so you would not catch this coordinate where. Exactly. Where both are. Yeah. And basically, I would say what general covariance is a statement that essentially, I get to pick whatever coordinates I want on my manifold, right? You can pick whatever coordinates you want, but then once you have chosen the set of coordinates, they apply for the full quantum state. You can't choose one for one guy and one for another guy. Now, the question that I want to ask was, you, you mentioned something about ion traps that the degree of confinement of an ion is some bound. I was wondering, like, we can look at the core electrons of uranium, for example. Yeah. Probably extremely confined. Yeah. Doesn't that provide a stronger bound? Uh, how localized was the uranium center of mass wave function? Well, let's say uh, let's say it's in in the metal. Right. So this is, is it, the, the right. Zero and at very low temp. Well, yeah. I, I imagine the zero point motion of uranium in a nuclear in an atom is quite in a crystal is quite low. But I'm actually well. But then the, uh, remember that again, right? So once you get into a real metal and things of that kind, your electron is not talking to all the other electrons as well, right? So it's one of those things where uh, the well, there are, there there there's. there's and I look at the one as electrons and diamonds. Right. No, no, but aren't they, 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 there are electromagnetic interactions between the core electron and other electrons, right? Yeah, true, yeah. And so essentially, if epsilon, let's say, is 10 to the minus 3, I'm just making that number up, uh, that will be rapidly subdominant to anything else that's going on in the, in the system. So it's more like, yeah, you need, you need the isolation. Well, or you have to characterize those things very well. Yes, yes, yes. That's yes. An experimentalist question. So, so where would there maybe be exciting experiments to, to sort of test this nonlinearity? And, and particularly, you know, there's some interesting stuff in supercritical circuits that have, you know, a lot of nonlinearity and stuff like that. Is that like a good playground to maybe test some of these? Well, so uh, I think we, we've kind of come to this sort of idea, understanding that there are sort of like really two processes you can take. One of these macroscopic superpositions, right? And the other are basically, I think, essentially the single ion style systems. Because the thing is, you know, when you think about any regular system, like what you're talking about, right? There are, uh, the, the actual world is very nonlinear, right? In the sense that if I have a bunch of electrons, they'll talk to each other very easily. So your ability to probe the electron talking to itself is quite constrained when all the other electrons are talking to you at the same time. So this is a lot similar to what the question you were asking, which is that if I look at uranium, for example, look, these electrons are talking to everything else. So how do you isolate a small self-interaction within yourself? Uh, hard to do. Uh, but again, right, so I think like really with macroscopic possibilities, there is this very sensible thing you can do. This, this sounds a little crazy, right, when you would talk about them. Uh, or you can do single ions. For single ions, clearly you're able to uh, separate out everything else and just uh, talk about how the system can evolve. And how about this spatially dependent entanglement examples you're using for pedagogical reasons, right? Yeah. So it seems like you were saying it's a propagator, so you could yeah. study things as a function of distance and see a time delay. Sure. At C, everything's moving at C, right? That yes, kind of yes. But then also it seemed like, I may be wrong here, depending upon what term is in the nonlinear Hamiltonian, the spatial dependence would vary. 
right sure. of the interaction. Yes. It's not just a time delay. There also could be a spatial variation. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, in a sense, if you, if you look at electromagnetism, it just tells you exactly what it is. Right? There's a Coulomb field. Right. So, so that's a lot like this ion clock experiment, where we're basically just taking this ion, splitting it into two, and then making this guy talk to the other guy. Right. That's, I think, what you have in mind here. Right. But, but also, I'm, I'm asking, in your thinking, is there's a structure that's nonlinear, but the states. Yes. Yes. But the actual terms, if you use the new palette as an example and emphasize it, yes. these other things. Yes. What should those, is that, a, is that fundamental or that any physics can go in there? And so if you're dealing with electrom, things that would normally be electromagnetic coupling for pictures. Yeah, you can use that. Yeah. You can use that, but that's the physics that you put in. You yes. Put, and the nonlinear is just in the, the states that you put in. The states that you so put then, in. You, then you would probably as an experimentalist want to choose something whereby the interaction, because again, Yes. Entanglement example, we can be twiddling the one on Mars and looking at the one on the Earth, or twiddling the one on this side of the lab and look at that side of the lab when you've entangled them. Yes. You wouldn't want to dilute the amplitude of the effect by having an interaction that falls off rapidly. You wouldn't, no. You'd want an interaction that falls off not slowly, rapidly. Slowly, yes. Slowly, yes. So that, and then study it as a function of separation. Absolutely, of absolutely. Sort of thing. absolutely, and absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, that was question one. Question two is pulsars. Yes. Millisecond binary pulsars, they're wonderful clocks. Yes. They're not quite strong gravity, they're like medium. Yeah, 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 is yeah. There's some potential there. Uh, we thought about them, but again, right, it is this factor of RS over R squared that appears in there. Yeah. And so it really, you know, is something where you, you want to get that cl close to one. Uh, so we thought about it a little bit and we couldn't really find any uh, convincing reason why that would be. I mean, uh, that, them is the long data set the tremendous that's right that's right yeah yeah no it, it might be possible might, yes yes yeah. it's true it's true it's true yeah yeah, yeah. so uh 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 so going all the wonderful gravitational wave folks are doing great stuff right they're not yet they're not precision instruments 15 they're not precision degrees. instruments, yeah, not precision instruments. Sure. absolutely absolutely no there, there might be something to do with that data absolutely yeah absolutely yeah yes Oh, we don't affect any of those, right? Because the thing is, uh, I'm not affecting the number of states below a given energy level. So I, one can actually show that uh, this, uh, with this modification, as long as epsilon is small enough, you know, uh, you don't, uh, you have the same number of eigenstates and things of that kind. So the Bell inequality is only really relied on the fact that uh, the number of angular momentum states that you have is finite. Okay and below any you know whatever and so uh you 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 you'll have exactly the same number of uh angular momentum eigenstates in this theory as well and so that shouldn't change more questions uh, i'll ask another one so yeah. you know i think you, you published in solid times i've seen some of your work um also in in superconducting systems you have solid times that are like clutch on so right and stuff right. like that so i mean that that seems very nonlinear in some sense, but also they can be non-interacting as solid mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. So I I'm see. wondering if you know some if there's something that pops in your mind related to solid uh, Not not immediately. Okay. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, but it's certainly an interesting question. I mean, I haven't thought about it. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you have non-interacting solitons, right? So the, the, the thing is, right, the way we have constructed this entire thing is that we are already building these things based on existing interactions. So what I would what I'd be worried about is basically that look uh, the reason why your solitons are not interacting with each other is because you were very clever and you knocked off all the all the electromagnetic fields, right? That's what you did. But then they would also knock off this effect too because I'm uh, you see I, I can never get rid of the uh, because I want causality. If I want this guy to talk to itself, I have to go through a field that carries a propagator and all this stuff. So anytime you cut that off, you will also lose my effect. Let's assume your basic framework is correct. Yeah. Let's assume clever experimentalists. Yeah. Jason Ellis, et cetera. Yeah. And others work really hard and do and, and conceive and complete impressive experiments. Yeah. Which limit epsilon, whatever parameters you want to uh, use, to very small numbers. Yeah. Increasingly small. Next generation makes it. Right. And it's a great thing, but we, the numbers are getting small. Um, what is that? What's your interpretation? Do you have an interpretation yet of what that means? Ah, it depends a lot on what the quantum state of the universe is, right? So if you have inflation, uh, I would say all these experiments are useless because uh, that epsilon, epsilon would be one, but alpha is 10 to the minus 500, okay? So here's the thing, right? So if Jason finds this stuff in his lab tomorrow, 
you have ruled out inflation. If you have found inflation in the sky, you've understood why all of Jason's experiments are actually going to be a thing. Okay. So then the, but then the black hole or pulsar experiments uh, go and then they're conceived, they're executed yes. extremely well. So yes. You know, so. Yes. Yes. And uh, they're also finding no effect. Yes. What does that imply? There's one more crazy possibility. Yeah. Okay. This is like it's completely nuts, but I think it's you know not not but more. I don't know if it's more nuts than anything I've already talked about. Uh, uh, so here is a possibility, right? So fundamentally, what's happening here is that um, uh, we are extremely interested now in what part of the wave function we are in, right? That's what that's what appears in here. So uh, think about life on Earth. Okay. Did we have events in our evolution which were quantum amplified? Which basically means the following thing that the rest of the universe could be very classical, right? The sun and the earth, they're all exactly where they are. On planet Earth, what happened is that there was some random event which caused evolution to do something very dramatic, which means if you look at the wave function on the Earth, it is a superposition of me sitting here and doing all these things, plus a superposition of like a cows in the same point in space, yeah. right? Well, that's, that's a possibility, yeah. right? So, uh, uh, yeah, 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 you know, uh, actually, this is even true in particle physics. So, so in particle, so we've kind of joked about this. Um, particle physics get very excited about anomalies, right? So, think about what this actually means. Suppose there is a, an anomaly at the LHC, and I, Sujit Rajendran, get excited about it, and I spend time working on that anomaly. Okay, now quantum mechanically, what I believe is that if, if there was a quantum fluctuation, right, there's a part of the wave function where I did not, me, Suchi Tajendran, did not get excited about the anomaly, and I was doing whatever I was doing. Right. Okay, so, uh, and let's say the part of the wave function where I got excited was 10 to the minus 50. Oh, sorry, so sorry, I mean, like uh, um, some, you know, three sigma thing, like 10 to the minus five, whatever, yeah. right? So now comes a very interesting fact that when Alex is going and doing his experiment, Right? It is me who went and told him to do this. Right. So he is sitting there, he is doing all the stuff. He is entangled to the 10 to the minus five part of the wave function that I am. Yeah. Right? Right. And the, I had no idea what the Sujit Rajendran in the other world was doing. Maybe he was more sane, didn't talk about nonlinear. I have no idea. Yeah. Right? So what you now see is that because of these kinds of quantum amplifications, as we would say, it is very reasonable that the um, quantum state of life on the earth is extremely diluted just because we get so excited about very stupid things. Okay, so that requires a third kind of experiment, which not, uh, so in that particular case, the pulsar everything would work normally because there isn't another metric interfering with it. Right. Right. Alex's experiments will be suppressed by the fact that evolution or whatever or something his particle physicists do diluted his part of the wave function tremendously. Right. But what would be true is basically that uh, the Earth would still be what it is in the entire wave function. There would be a magnetic field from the Earth that will still be true. So what you can now do is go in a hidden dark room or whatever, block off all magnetic fields, and try to find the magnetic field of the rest of the Earth at order epsilon in your in your particular setup. See so you know what I'm saying? It's like it's like I've uh, if uh, I am a very small part of the of the, of, the, of the state here, right? So but so the entire state in the entire state, the Earth is still here. The Earth still has a big magnetic field. Let me now go to a shielded room that completely blocks off the Earth's magnetic field right. in my world. But the uh, expectation value doesn't care about the shield. So I can still find that magnetic field in a so shielded room. That magnetic field on the yes. uh, ranching. Yes. Turn you know, girl like experiment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I see. I see. So that's a third crazy possibility. And, you know, like all of these. Things turn now, okay, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's uh, this is a speculative theory that I came up with during the pandemic. It doesn't sound completely ridiculous. So, uh, you know, uh, maybe it's zero for somebody, but I don't see it, right? Like basically I look at the structure of that theory and I say, well, you know, um, there's nothing wrong with it, logically. And assuming, I'm gonna, assume, I'm gonna stop here in a second. Yeah, yeah. Just, this implication is very interesting. Let's assume all the quantum field theory experts in the world agree with you and sounds like Polchinski at the core of, of the beginning of the idea yes. 30 years ago or something like this. Yes. Um, that this is allowed structurally. Yeah. If it isn't there, experiment shows it isn't there increasingly well, then what it means is of interest, it's just to me is, is of increasing interest, right? Yes. But maybe it's emergent thing that isn't there. Mm -hmm. that allowed doesn't maybe all ultimately matter very much because of the history of our universe. Exactly. Or, exactly. That's, I think, in particular interesting. 
Yeah. Anyhow, I'm expressing my feelings. Sorry. Let's anybody have any further questions? No, let's uh, thanks, Rajiv, again. Thank you so much.